one of the partners at Hotfoot Design. Um, in case you don't know us, just give you a really quick introduction in terms of what we do. We're a creative agency. Um, we've been established 13 years. We work across quite a few different sectors of food and drink, uh, health and beauty across the kind of the third sector and academia. We've got a team of 16 creative specialists working as designers, developers, copywriters, uh, photographers. Um, we're probably what's known as a boutique agency, although we don't really use that term. Um, and uh, uh, we mostly work in the north, but we've got a, a growing band of clients down south as well. And I didn't have to travel too far to get here today because we're actually based in this building. So any excuse to, <laughs> any excuse to slide down the banister. Um, we love working with our clients to help grow their business uh, fundamentally and understanding what makes them special, what makes them different and, and telling that story and reaching new audiences. And as an agency, I think where we add value is because we're not just delivery partners, we aim to be uh, strategic advisors as well. Um, so let's get started. So. Um, I don't know if you've read The Godfather, you've probably seen the movie, but the author of The Godfather, Mario Puzo, once told a story about how in Sicily the Mafia would sometimes send ransom notes in advance, and that way if you paid up you wouldn't have to go to the troublesome business of being kidnapped and they wouldn't have to go to the troublesome business of actually kidnapping you, it was a, a bit of a win-win. And, and this only worked because they, the victims understood that the Mafia meant business, they understood what they, what they stood for. And so what a creative agency's role really uh, is to make sure that we define and communicate what our clients stand for. Um, it's about making sure that it's understood what makes a brand special uh, and unique. And if we can show that and convey that through the materials that are designed and the campaigns that are run, then we've got a pretty good chance of convincing clients uh, that, that they offer the right choice for their needs and so that the client in turn can make their customer an offer they can't refuse. Um, so, but a value proposition has to be more than perception, it has to be more than skin deep. It has to be representative of the actual customer experience. It needs to run through the brand like writing on a stick of Blackpool Rock. Um, because if it doesn't, th there's going to be trouble. So I think it's interesting to look at examples of where this works well and where, and where it doesn't. So let's start with everybody's possibly least favourite eyeline, but popular all the same, Ryanair. So for a really long time they had a very simple value proposition which is that they, uh, as expressed in the original slogan, which is that they are a low-cost airline. And everything they do is about reinforcing this message so that there's an indelible association with low cost. So they've done lots of PR stunts around this about saying things like they're going to uh, charge you a pound if you want to use the onboard lose, um, or they're going to have standing seats, or their HQ doesn't have carpets, all these kinds of things that are really just meant to plant that seed and create that link between Ryanair and low cost. And it works because their value proposition does match the customer experience on the ground or, or in the air, in their case. People know what to expect, it's, it's no frills, and so people will tolerate discomfort to some extent as long as the flights are punctual and obviously they land safely. Uh, and then now Europe's largest low-cost airline, they're the second largest airline in Europe after Lufthansa. They carry 130 million passengers, so clearly it works. But when you look at um, British Airways, by contrast, they've struggled somewhat because they can no longer really claim to be the world's favourite airline. Um, they are premium, but they're not as premium as, say, Emirates. So they've kind of had that mantle taken away from them because other airlines are perceived to have a more premium service. And at the same time, they're being forced to compete with the low-cost carriers on their home turf. Um, but they're being hampered by their legacy as a high-end carrier. So when they announced, for example, that they were not going to offer inclusive in-flight meals anymore on their short-haul flights, it created a kind of cognitive dissonance. You know, what, how can they not offer that? That's, that's what they do, surely. Um, and then there was uproar as a result. And it's interesting when you look at research about how people tend to rate experiences as customers, they tend to rate the experience based on how closely it matches their expectations, not on how good it actually was objectively. So if you look at TripAdvisor, for example, budget hotels will often rate higher than luxury hotels. And it's not because the budget hotel offers a better experience, it's because they match the customer's expectations more closely. Um, so I think that's, that's quite interesting. And I think matching expectations is, is something that every business needs to think about. How do you manage the customer's expectations? Um, another example of a brand meeting reality with a, with a bang is, is Carlsberg. So as you'll know, for years and years they advertised Carlsberg as being probably the world's best lager. And that became increasingly ludicrous, especially in the midst of a craft ale revolution. So clearly Carlsberg don't have the best lager, but they continued with this tongue-in-cheek slogan uh, until it became obvious that it just didn't work anymore. 
And the fact that they'd kind of acknowledged this came to light when their official Twitter account unexpectedly started retweeting customer criticism. So their official account announced um, via a retweet that uh, Carlsberg tasted like drinking a bath water that your grandmother had died in. Another, <laughs> another tweet came from a user that they retweeted that said Carlsberg tasted like the rancid piss of Satan. <laughs> so at first people thought, is this a hacker? Somebody hacked them? Is it a rogue social media employee that's kind of on the way out the door to go and live in a cabin in Denmark? But no, it turned out it was quite a clever way to draw attention to the fact that they were actually going to reformulate their core beer with a new recipe. I don't know if it's going to work, but I think it's good that they're at least trying to reposition their brand and sort of be authentic and honest about where they really do sit in the market. Setting customer expectations can be achieved in quite surprising ways. So you'll be familiar with the quirky and playful language of innocent drinks, for example. And that's made their brand stand out from day one. And it actually came about out of necessity rather than any kind of grand vision. The founders didn't have any money for advertising, so they realised the only space they had to tell their story was actually on the packaging. Um, so they decided to, instead of just list the ingredients and say how good the drink was for you, in a kind of school marmish way, instead they tried to be quite quirky and playful. And that obviously worked for them because they sold the business, or 90% of the business, for around £100 million. And that approach is all pervasive now, so you start to see countless brands adopting a kind of chatty persona, which either charms or irritates, depending on how well it's done. Um, a really good example, I think, is the banking app Monzo. So they've got a really clearly defined um, tone of voice that makes them stand out from HSBC and NatWest. HSBC and NatWest are great in comparison to Monzo anyway, but that's really exacerbated when you actually read the copy. And what's good is that they don't just have quirky language in their advertising or on their um, social media presence. It's actually present in the terms and conditions in terms of the headings. So their brand experience is really consistent. Water, colourless, odourless, tasteless, but it's not stopped brands from trying to convince us that their water has got special properties. Um, Evian solemnly explains that its water takes a 15-year journey through the French Alps. Highland Springs says it's naturally and slowly driven through many layers of basalt rock to become immaculately filtered. Volvic claims to be free from the incline of the natural world, of the, of the outside world. I have no idea what that means. Sales of water are skyrocketing though. Uh, 1.77 million litres bought in the UK last year, exceeding sales of Coke for the first time. Sales are on track to exceed 4.7 litres, 4.7 billion litres rather, by 2021. It's the fastest growing drink sector in the world. And uh, whilst the big water producers dominate supermarket shelves, Nice brands are emerging all the time with Instagram friendly labels and overexcitable marketing campaigns. Um, one Australian brand, Frequency H2O, goes as far to describe their beverage as a synthesis of wisdom and evolution and the ultimate elixir of life, which is absurd, obviously, um, but profitable. But luckily, there are brands out there to save us from ourselves. Having the confidence to pursue a novel idea and communicate it, its meaning can be awe-inspiring. So back in the late 1990s, a lady called Abigail Forsyth ran an independent chain of coffee shops uh, in Melbourne called Blue Bag with her brother. And she got really annoyed at this growing pile of uh, take up cups in the bins outside, uh, people just leaving them on the tables, empty bottles, plastic stuff. So she began looking for a reusable alternative and she couldn't find one. So in 2007, she decided to launch her own reusable cups under the brand name Keep Cup. And in fact, she was told by one business advisor that it was the stupidest idea he'd ever heard. But it worked, you know, the first Keep Cups were sold to coffee fans in Melbourne through their own shops and at boutique markets as a kind of niche product. But then soon other cafes in, in Australia started to adopt it. And now she's got a company with offices in Melbourne, LA, and London. And they've really committed themselves to being ethical. They produce the cups within, you know, get them made within their local markets rather than in China and they've sold over 8 million reusable cups. They think they prevented 12 billion disposable cups from ending up in landfill. So as public awareness of the plastic problem grows, as documentary footage of oceans clogged with plastic becomes prevalent, as national governments look at taxing plastic cups, the far-sighted founder of, of Keep Cup will be, will be ready. It's argue, you know, it can be argued that too many businesses prioritise making a sale over everything else, whether by winning new customers, or by squeezing money out of existing customers. And in the short term, this can seem like a smart strategy. If you're looking to sell your business, then obviously having a lot of new business is great for potential acquirers, but it's not usually a very sustainable practice. Failure to invest in customer satisfaction can lead to complaints, bad reviews, negative word of mouth, fewer repeat purchases, 
And companies that are trapped in this cycle of kind of high sales but low retention can find that they're running to stand still, and which is kind of the definition of being a busy fool. A good example of a business that does value, the, does value loyalty is Ritz-Carlton. So their employees are said to have a discretionary budget of up to $2,000 a day to spend on customer satisfaction. And there's an example of a guest that left their laptop charger in their room uh, and then they left, checked out, and by the time they got home, a courier was there to greet them with the, with the, with the charger before they noticed it was even missing. So it's expensive, um, but it, this widely shared story is really, you know, arguably more powerful than any advertising. Another example is Glossier. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but they're another business that's built a phenomenal reputation based on satisfaction. You know, beauty is a huge industry, 382 billion globally, and historically it's been dominated by the big corporates, Procter & Gamble, Estee Lauder, Unilever and so on. Uh, seven of the largest cosmetic brands, um, or companies rather, own 170 different brands. So they kind of dominate that. They know how to take their products from the lab to the, to the, to the shelf, but things are starting to change. Customers are no longer discovering new beauty products in the pages of Glossy magazines. They're now discovering them in their Instagram feeds. Um, and Glossier is a really good example of that, of a direct consumer brand that's become famous really thanks to Instagram. Uh, when you see a brand in your social feed, surrounded by updates from your friends, it has an implied endorsement if your friend already likes that brand. Um, the ads feel more personal to you than a broadcast ad on television. So it kind of makes you feel like you might be the master of your own destiny and you're not just kind of following the corporate overlords like you might do when you buy a big brand product. And they've, but one way that they've really made their brand consistent in terms of the customer experience is that they've empowered their customer service agents. They, don't, they actually sit with a marketing team, so they don't sit in a separate call center. They call them editors, and they're uh, able to reply in the, in, you know, in naturally, um, write personal replies. They don't use canned responses. Um, so their so-called sort of G team is basically a division of marketing. It's not a separate complaints department or something like that. And what they found is that good service creates advocates, which in turn leads to more revenue, more repeat purchases. So my uh, fiance Louisa and I went to New York um, a few weeks ago and made a almost, almost like a she's a designer as well. So a bit of a brand pilgrimage to Warby Parker in Brooklyn. This is a, another direct-to-consumer brand, but they have got now some boutique shops as well. And they're in opticians, but they're not in opticians as you would recognize if you've been spec savers. Um, it's like a kind of, feels more like a bookshop or a record shop. Um, and they've very cleverly built a business that it takes on the high street opticians by offering um, something different, something direct. Uh, it's just a beautiful experience. It's more experiential than, than a traditional kind of uh, um, uh, spec savers type business would be. So direct to consumer brands offer entrepreneurs and investors the prospect of owning a whole customer experience, and that's a big difference. They're not trying to get shelf space with a, with a third party retailer. And that's why e uh, commerce mattress company Casper has raised 240 million in funding to try and beat the bricks and mortar mattress stores, and why Unilever paid a billion dollars to buy Dollar Shave Club. Uh, over the last few years, direct to consumer brands have, have popped up in almost every vertical imaginable, from beauty to beverages to fashion and healthcare. And each of these businesses really a bet on the future of retail. And the model can work so long as people understand what they're, what they're buying into. Talking again about the kind of future of retail as an experience or um, hospitality as an experience. There's 250 million um, photos on Instagram associated with the hashtag food. People are obsessed with dining and cooking. And restaurateurs are increasingly exploiting this trend. Uh, by creating dishes and experiences that people can take a picture of and share with their friends. So if you go to the Soho restaurant, Bob Bob Ricard, you'll see press for champagne buttons. And if you sit there for a few minutes, you'll see people taking pictures of these things. So people are starting to realize that they need to create experiences that people can share and make their customers really their best salespeople. So this is one of our clients, um, Braids Farm. They're a dairy farm in the Loon Valley. They've been so for generations farming there, but recently, like all dairy farms, they've been subjected to the fluctuating price of milk, which essentially is a commodity product, and that's driven a lot of dairy farms out of business. So they came up with a genius idea, I think it's a genius idea, to create milk specifically for baristas, and they did that by, mo most milk is blended from different sources. Their milk comes from a single source of Jersey cows and black and white cows, 
and it has a consistent level of protein, so that means that when baristas pour the, the cream, it, it retains its foam, it retains its shape, so they can do the barista art, which is important if you're doing hundreds of co coffees a day. And we work with them to create a brand identity, the website, the packaging, and to tell that story. Uh, and they've been featured everywhere from Radio 4 Today programme to Vice magazine. Uh, all, you know, they've been very broadly covered. And they're now in cafes across London and other cities where there's a concentration of good cafes. So I really like this case study because it's, an, it's, you know, it's all about innovation and storytelling combined to establish a value proposition that's different and in the category that people haven't really thought about. And it's a great way for coffee shops to differentiate their offering too, because obviously they've all got multiple varieties of coffee. That's a given in a coffee shop now. Not many have actually got special milk. So it's thinking around the edges, thinking outside the box about how to create a space that perhaps didn't exist before. This is another client, um, Breathing Space, a completely different type of client of ours. Um, it's an initiative to prevent youth homelessness in East Lancashire. It's a Lancashire County Council project, but it was not branded as such because it, it was very important that young people could relate to this. And Lancashire County Council is perhaps not a very relatable brand for a young person. So we created the name Breathing Space and we put in motion a plan to reach young people at the time and place that worked best for them. So after undertaking workshops and understanding the tone of voice and understanding how to relate to the target audience, we created a website, but it gives an opportunity for people to get in touch via text. A lot of people don't want to pick the phone up at that, at that age. Um, we also have obviously a big presence on social media, but there are flyers in fast food outlets, there are stickers in bus shelters, and it's helped, uh, I think in the last quarter, 400 young people stay safe. And I think it works because the message has been delivered in a form and format that's relevant and relatable to its target audience. And this is another uh, client as well. Uh, this uh, organisation is called Restorative Solutions. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of restorative justice, but it's about bringing victims of crime together with the perpetrators. It has to be initiated by the victim, but it can just help that healing process where there's been a crime. But it's a, it's a topic that's sensitive. There are people on social media and that read the Daily Mail that have got very strong opinions about it. So it's something that had to be handled carefully, and, um, but we know that victims of crime can gain from it tremendously. Um, but victims of crime might be nervous about making that first approach. So it was all about how can we tell this story in the right mediums with the right message, distilling down that value proposition to something that could be easily understood and then communicated against lots of, uh, across lots of different channels throughout the country. And I just think it's really interesting how the same underlying principles can work in all these different sectors. And uh, finally, it doesn't have to be a brand in the traditional sense that can benefit from this approach. Back in 2010, um, Altrinum had one of the highest proportions of empty shops in the country. One in three were unoccupied. A similar story in lots of towns around the UK. Internet shopping and out-of-town retail parks were being held to blame. Not, not unfairly, they certainly you know, are partly to blame. And the only hope was, was thought to be more charity shops, more, uh, more pound shops. But today, things in Altrinum are different. The rate of vacancies has fallen by three quarters. Visits to the town centre up by 25%. And at the heart of that is a renovated place, uh, out in the market house, which is a brilliant um, kind of food and drink hall with communal tables, independent kitchens, hand-picked stalls, offering everything from Lebanese wraps to sourdough bread, craft beer to artisan chocolate. It's busy, commercially successful, £5 million annual turnover. Um, and it's leading more people to go and visit the town. The project was led by Nick Johnson and, and Jen... Uh, Nick Johnson... Jen Thompson, difficult to say, and Market Operations, and that's the same company that turned the neglected Grade 2 listed building in uh, Manchester's Northern Quarter into the brilliant Mackie Mayer, which is where um, Atkinson's Coffee have a, have a presence. Uh, so Outchin and Market and Mackie Mayer, two brilliant examples of what can happen when imagination and ingenuity combine with some investment to prove the doomsayers wrong and show there is huge untapped potential in our town centres. The Peace Hall in Halifax is another good example. Yeah, it required a big chunk of money to renovate this amazing gallery courtyard, but it's now home to a range of boutique shops and food and drink places. And more towns want in on the action. Plans are uh, underway in Macclesfield to transform the 100-year uh, Pictodrome cinema into a European-style food court. It'd be amazing if this happened in Lancaster as well. Uh, a town centre's value proposition, in other words, does not need to be reliant on chain stores. Uh, and there's just so much enthusiasm for these projects. It just shows there's big pent-up demand for vibrant places that have a social purpose. Uh, so to conclude, I think everybody has a story to tell. 
Um, sometimes we're too close to our own daily operations within businesses to be able to see them. We can't always know what people want from us. So it's just helpful to take a step back and try and rethink how to engage people in a different way. The, current, the sort of theme that runs through all of these examples is where people have looked at things sideways, looked at things differently, thought outside the box a little bit and thought about how to change things for the better. Thank you for listening.